Good evening, this is Orson Welles, your producer of a special series of broadcasts presented by the makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon. The Mercury Summer Theater of the Air. Tonight and every Friday night, Pabst Blue Ribbon presents you with a front row seat in America's favorite summer theater. So, while America's famous producer, writer-director, Orson Welles, entertains you, pour yourself a tall, frosted glass of Pabst Blue Ribbon and enjoy at the same time great entertainment and this truly great beer. And now, Mr. Welles. Tonight, the Mercury brings you one of the loveliest of all love stories. It's by John Galsworthy, and it's called The Apple Tree. It was Stella's and my silver wedding anniversary. We'd motored to Torquay where we first met to celebrate. And Stella had suggested that we take a lunch and drive out on the moor. It would be so lovely there, Frank. It's quite warm in the sun. I can do some sketching while you read. We drove several miles and stopped on a high hill with a view into the deep valley beyond. Stella wandered off somewhere to sketch and I stretched out in the sun and watched the sky and longed for... I knew not what. There was no reason I should be unhappy or even mildly disturbed. My life had been pleasant. My marriage quite successful, but as I lay there, it seemed to me that there was something missing. Something that had nothing to do with pleasant lives or successful marriages. The familiar words of Hippolytus echoed in my mind. The apple tree. The apple tree, the singing, and the gold. The apple tree. And then quite suddenly... I remembered. I'd been here before. Years before. I'd stood on this self-same hill. I knew the valley into which I looked. That ribbon of road and the old well behind. Life has moments of sheer beauty. Of unbidden flying rapture. But they last no longer than the span of a cloud's flight over the sun. I'd stumbled on just such a moment. In my own life, I'd stumbled on a buried memory, a wild, sweet time. It was after my first year in college. A friend of mine, Robert Cart, and I were making a walking tour of the country around Torquay. But my knee, which had been injured in a football game the year before, was giving me trouble. I knew I'd have to give up the tour. We were looking for a farmhouse somewhere where we could put up until I got better. I don't think you ought to walk much farther, Frank. Why don't I go ahead and reconnoiter? Oh, I won't need to. There's someone coming. There's a girl. The wind blew her crude little skirt against her legs and lifted her battered tam o It was clear she was a country girl. Her shoes were split, her hands were rough and brown, and her hair waved untidily across her forehead. But her lashes were long and dark, and her gray eyes were a wonder. Dewey, as if opened for the first time that day. Hello. Could you tell us if there's a farm near here where we could spend the night? My friend's getting pretty lame. There's our farm, sir. Oh, could you put us up? I'm sure my aunt would be glad to. If you like, I'll show you the way. We'd appreciate it very much. It's not very far, just down the valley. Right through the apple orchard, and we're there. Just through a narrow wood, we came on the farm. A long, low, stone-built house with casement windows and a farmyard where pigs and fowls and an old mare were straying about and in front, an orchard of apple trees just breaking into flower. A woman stood by the door watching as we approached. This is Mrs. Narakol, my aunt. And we met your niece on the road. She said she... She thought you might put us up. Well, I can if you don't mind one room. Megan, get the spare room ready and a bowl of cream. The gentleman will be wanting tea, I expect. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Merrigan. By the way, I, we haven't been introduced. No, sir. Well, this is Robert Carton. I'm Frank Asher. How do you do, sir? Hello. What's your name? 
Meek and David. Are you a Devonshire girl? Oh, no, sir. I'm from Wales. You're very young, aren't you? I'm 17, sir. Well, how many of you live here? Well, there's my aunt and her two nephews. The boys who saw you came. Nick and Rick, they're caught. Then there's old Jim, a hired man. Quite a family. Yes, sir. If there's anything else you want, you call. All right. Thank you. Pretty thing, isn't she? Huh. Pretty, she's like a flower. Like a wildflower. You come on unexpectedly in the woods. Mm, a bit poetic for me. But I see your point. I say, Frank, your knee is pretty bad. Yeah. What do you say I leave you here for a couple of days? Well, it does hurt like the devil. What about you? Well, I have to get back to London, but I can get the train from Torquay. That is, if you don't mind being left alone. As a matter of fact, I should like it. Nothing to do but dream and watch spring on a farm. I've always wanted to do that. Well, good luck to you, then. Look me up when you get to London. And uh, be careful of the wildflowers. <laughs> Good to be left alone. I think they were glad to have me. Negan and her aunt worried about my lameness as if I'd been one of the family. From the very first, I'd felt that Megan liked me. She performed little kindnesses for me that weren't part of her duties. As the days went by, I began to expect them. When I woke in the morning, the thought of her made me anxious to be up and downstairs... Even if I didn't talk with her, I liked to be near where I could hear her singing at her work. One day I was down by the big apple tree. And the two little boys, Nick and Rick, were playing there by the pool. <laughs> Watch out, Rick. The gypsy bogle will get you. Gypsy bogle? <laughs> what do you mean by the gypsy bogle, Rick? The gypsy bogle sits on the stone there by the apple tree Oh, sometimes. what does he look like? Don't know. Never seen him. Megan says he's that there. Megan's afeard of him. Oh? But she's not afeard of you. She says a prayer for you. Well, how do you know that, you little rascal? When I was asleep, she said, God bless us all and Mr. Rashes. I heard her whispering. <laughs> you're a little rough in to tell what you hear when you're not meant to hear it. You see, Rick, I told you not to tell him. Nick, Rick, come here, both Here of they you. are, Megan. And I've been looking all over for the rascal. <laughs> go into the house at once. <laughs> Conte wants you. Now go on with you. Nick told her about the gypsy bogle. <laughs> go on now. No more nonsense out of here. <laughs> Children are silly sometimes. Oh, I don't think so. They're often more sensible than grown-ups. Tell me, Megan. What's this gypsy bogle they're talking about? He brings bad things. They're bogles in the rocks. And men who lived long ago. There's one that comes here and sits on that rock. Oh, I should come down one night and sit on the rock there and have a talk with him. Oh, please don't. Something will happen to him. Well, does it matter if anything happened to me, Megan? Would it disturb you a lot? Well, I dare say I shan't see him because I suppose I shall have to be off pretty soon. Oh, no. Would you like me to stay? Yes. Very much. Well, then I will stay. And tonight, Megan, I will... I'm going to say a prayer for you. You're laughing at me. You're laughing at us, all of us. That's not true, Megan. Believe me, that's not true. Why? I... Wait, Megan. Your hair. Your hair. It's caught in the apple blossoms. Don't move, Megan. Don't move. Oh, you're... you're beautiful with those clusters of pink blossoms in your dark hair. Very, very sweet, Megan. You too. Megan, come here tonight to the big apple tree after they've gone to bed. Megan, promise. I promise. time after Megan had fled away through the orchard, I stood there under the apple tree. This was the beginning of what? 
She was so lovely, so unutterably lovely and untouched. I felt somehow as if I'd beheld a miracle, and it had transformed me. I walked on toward the wild meadow. Jim, the hired man, was out there. Good evening to you, Mr. Rasher. The, it is brave weather for the grass. Jim, they, they tell me you've seen the gypsy boggle. Uh, have you seen it too, is that right? Well, it were in my mind as twas there this evening, a little of four. Ask Megan. If she was there, she's seen him. Yeah. Yeah, she's sensitive. She, she feels everything. She's very loving-hearted. Loving-hearted. Hey. Yes. That was it. What was I to do about this girl who loved me so? And whom I loved? I walked for a long time. In the orchard, I broke off a spray from a crab apple tree. The buds were like Megan. Shell pink. Rose pink. Wild and fresh. And the opening flowers white and wild and touching. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to our Mercury production of John Galsworthy's great love story, The Apple Tree. Now, before we bring you the final act of the apple tree, here's Jimmy Warlington, who has the glint of an old grad in his eyes. He thinks of the coming football season. Ah, oh, yes, Orson. Tomorrow and next Saturday, the old pigskin season swings into action. Those first really post-war 11s gallop out on the field. And that reminds me, of course, of blended splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. For what is that truly great beer but a team? A blend of never less than 33 fine brews, each in itself an all-American for flavor and quality. Yes, and what is finer than to have the team right with you in a tall, foam-capped glass as you sit by your radio and listen to the referee's whistle start the Saturday gridiron battles? Yes, friends, you'll find me tomorrow right by my radio, listening to a football game, and right beside me where I can enjoy that perfect flavor, not too heavy, not too light, but clean, fresh, sparkling, will be a good supply of blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. And say, incidentally, friends, if you occasionally can't get all the Pabst Blue Ribbon you wish, please keep on asking your dealer for it. We're doing our best to get you your share of blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. And now part two of Orson Welles' Mercury production of the famous love story by John Galsworthy, The Apple Tree. She kept her promise. Megan met me under the apple tree that night. She came straight toward me. And into my arms. And our lips sought each other. And we stood there together. For a long time in the moonlight. Megan, why did you come? Sir, you asked me to. Megan, darling, don't call me sir. Should I be calling you? Frank. Oh, I couldn't. But you love me, don't you? I couldn't help loving you, and I want to be with you. That's all. That's all? I shall die if I can't be with you. You shall be with me forever, Megan. Forever. We'll go to London. I'll show you the world. I don't care where we go. If I can be with you... That's all. Tomorrow, dear, I'll, I'll go to Torquay and get some money and get you some clothes that won't be noticed when we get to London. If you love me well enough, we'll be married. Oh, no, I couldn't. I only want to be with you. Oh, Megan, I'm not nearly good enough for you. Tell me. When did you begin to love me? When I saw you on the road and you looked at me. But I never thought you'd want me. Oh, my darling. My darling. 
Oh, look. Look, the gypsy bogle. The gypsy bogle? Well, I don't see anything. They're sitting on the stone under the tree. Megan. There's nothing there, only the moonlight on the rock. I saw him, and I'm afraid. Bad sign. A bad sign. I must go in. Darling, Megan, there's nothing there. There's no gypsy bogle. It's only your imagination. You don't see the bogle, but I see them. No, no. Good night. Megan. Megan! I heard the gate click. Knew she'd gone. Instead of a... Only this old apple tree. And the scent of the woods. A little part of her. And above me and around... The blossoms. More living, more moonlit than ever. Seem to glow... And breathe. Next morning, I left early and went to Torquay. I wanted to get some money, and I had to cash a check, but I found that without credentials, I'd have to wait till they wired the London Bank for verification. While I waited for the answer, I shopped for a dress for Megan. Here's something, sir. It's very smart. The more I looked at those modish gowns, the less they seemed suited to Megan. It was incredible that Megan, my Megan, could ever be dressed in anything except the rough tweed skirt and... Battered tam I'd always seen her wear. Couldn't make up my mind, and yet... She couldn't wear her old clothes in London. They, they wouldn't suit her either. Couldn't make up my mind. I walked the streets of Torquay. Confused and undecided. Well, Frank Ashurst... Haven't seen you since rugby. Oh, Halliday. Phil Halliday, this is a surprise. Hey, if you're not lunching anywhere, come with me. Uh, I'm here with my sister, Stella. Oh, that's good. I... I'd love to see Stella, and I haven't any good reason for refusing, Phil. Oh, great, Scott. I've completely forgotten the time. It's after three and the bank's closed. Splendid. And that means you'll have to stay over in oh, no, no, I, I can't do oh, We should love to have you. I know Phil's getting bored to death with me, and we've had such fun. Yes, it has been fun, Stella. I've been rustic for so long, I'd almost forgotten how pleasant London talk can be. Very well. <laughs> I'll stay. <laughs> I sent a wire to Mrs. Narrakum. I hoped that Megan would understand. Just this one day away from her wouldn't matter. It was the life that I'd always known. Gay, cheerful, normal people. Just a few more hours of their life before I left it altogether didn't seem wrong. Stella was a pretty thing. Curious the calm way she looked at me. As if she understood everything and... I never questioned too deeply. But that night I couldn't sleep. I thought of Megan. I was with her again. Under the living, breathing whiteness of the blossoms... The moonlight on her upturned face, a face of innocence and humble passion. Megan, poor little trusting Megan. How much did I really love her? How much was madness and the spring and the wild beauty of her? I thought of Stella. Stella, cool, poised and friendly. Stella belonged to the world I knew and understood, a world that understood me. Megan. Megan didn't understand, and she never could belong. She loved me, but was that enough for either of us? I didn't know what to do. Phil and Stella had asked me to go with them to Totnes for a picnic. I... I hadn't given them a definite answer, nor had I sent any further wire to Mrs. Narricombe. Today I had to decide. I knew that. I went out for a walk along the cliff wall. 
There's a high sea running. There weren't many people out. I'd walked a mile or so, I guess, before I saw her. There she was. Megan in her old skirt and jacket and tam o She was looking for me. I knew that at once. She'd look up into the faces of the passers-by, wavering, lost-looking, and somehow pitiful. I'd followed her a long way. Once she stopped and leaned against the sea wall. I wanted her again. I wanted her kisses. Her abandonment, all her quick, warm, pagan emotion. And the wonderful feeling of that night under the moonlit apple tree. Yet I... I couldn't move toward her. I couldn't let her know I was there. For suddenly I realized that... to go back to the farm and love Megan, out in the woods, among the rocks, with everything around wild and fitting, that was what I wanted... And that was impossible. But to transplant her to the town, to keep her in some little flat, and when the wild ecstasy wore off, to find her commonplace, unable to fit into my world, and no longer able to go back to her own, that was worse. Far worse. I took another long, last look that pathetic, wistful figure staring out over the sea. Goodbye, Megan. Goodbye, my darling. Goodbye. Three days later, I went back to London traveling with the Hallidays. On the last day of April in the following year, Stella and I were married. All this I remembered as I sat there on the hill in the warm sun. And as I remembered an ache for a lost youth, a hankering and a sense of wasted love and sweetness gripped me. And the sun no longer warm, I got up and walked a ways down the road. There's a man standing by what I saw was a grave, an old man, he was. And the grave was by the crossroads. There was a moor stone to the west. And on it, someone had thrown a blackthorn spray and a handful of bluebells. Good afternoon to you, sir. A nice day for a walk. Can you tell me whose grave this is? Well, now, it's quite a story. It was a poor soul that killed herself. It was a long time ago. She was a pretty girl, but... Too loving-hearted. Too? Too loving-hearted? In them days, I was working for Mrs. Norricombe, and she was too... There was a college gentleman staying with us. She took a fancy to him. He was a nice fellow, too. Then one day he went away sudden-like and never come back. After that, she was crying a lot, and then one day I found her. She was lying in a pool by the old apple tree. By the stone where the gypsy boulder sat. It was June then, but she'd found a little bit of apple blossom and stuck it in her ear. I walked away. I'd heard enough. On the top of the hill, I lay down and buried my face in my hands. Megan's face brushed close. Megan, with a sprig of apple blossoms and her dark, wet hair. If I could be with you, that's all. If I could be with you. Oh, there you are, Frank. Look at my sketch. It's pretty, don't you think? Oh, oh yes, it's very pretty. Still... There's something wanting, isn't there? Yes. Yes. 
There was something wanting. The apple tree was singing. You have just heard the Orson Welles Mercury production of The Apple Tree by John Galsworthy. Mr. Wells will return in just a moment. But first, let me again remind you to be patient with your dealer when, occasionally these days, he is unable to supply you with all the Pabst Blue Ribbon you'd like. He's doing his best, you can be sure of that. Yes, and here's something else you can be sure of. Every single bottle of Pabst Blue Ribbon you do get will, as always, be the happy blending of never less than 33 fine brews. Yes, every foaming, frosty glass you enjoy will, as always, have that famous Pabst Blue Ribbon flavor. Not too heavy, not too light, but fresh, clean, sparkling, with a real beer taste coming through the way you like it. So keep asking for blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. And now, Mr. Wells. Ladies and gentlemen, because we have a couple of minutes before it's time to say good night... I'd like to read you a poem. Like our story tonight, deals with love and lost love. It's by Ernest Dawson. It's a great favorite. It's called Cinera. Last night, ah, yes, tonight, betwixt her lips and mine, there fell thy shadow, Cinera. Thy breath was shed upon my soul between the kisses and the wine. And I was desolate and sick of an old passion. Yea, I was desolate and bowed my head. I have been faithful to thee, sinner, in my fashion. All night, upon mine heart, I felt her warm heart beat. Night long within mine arms in love and sleep she lay. Surely the kisses of her bought red mouth were sweet. But I was desolate and sick of an old passion when I awoke and found the dawn was gray. I have been faithful to thee, Sinera, in my fashion. I have forgot much, Sinera. Gone with the wind, flung roses... Roses riotously with the throng, dancing to put thy pale, lost lilies out of mind. But I was desolate and sick of an old passion. Yea, all the time, because the dance was long. I have been faithful to thee, Cinera. In my fashion, I cried for madder music and for stronger wine. And when the feast is finished, and the lamps expire, then falls thy shadow, Cinera. The night is thine. And I am desolate and sick of an old passion, yea, hungry for the lips of my desire. I have been faithful to thee, Cinera, in my fashion. And now it's time to say good night. Next week's show is Shakespeare's King Lear. Till then, we remain as always. Obediently yours. This program came to you through the courtesy of the Pabst Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, makers of blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.